So in an overview, seven point one through seven point six, the first six sections of the chapter were about integration techniques. And integration techniques, that did not work. Integration techniques is actually the title of the chapter. <clears throat> then 7.7, .7, we skipped it. It was an optional section on numerical integration, which we did not cover and never planned to cover. So therefore, there were no homework assignments on it, and there will be no problems from that section on the midterm. Then in 7.8, we did improper integrals, like where one of the limits of integration is infinity or something like that. And then in 7.9, we figured with a big section with a lot of stuff in it on differential equations. So that's, uh, that included what they are, what solutions look like, what an initial condition problem is, direction fields, particular solutions, all kinds of stuff. So that's why there are two additional problems from 7.9 than in the other sections. But if you look, there's six sections in the beginning, then two more sections at the end, that's a total of eight sections. Four problems from each makes 32 problems two extra problems on differential equations gets you to the 34 problems that are in the midterm on Wednesday. So that they're mostly evenly spread with a couple of extra for the last section. So there's an overview. And so the big thing to see is that the first six out of the eight sections, the first 75% of the chapter is just about doing integrals, how to do integrals various integration techniques. And the last couple of sections apply that information to a couple of new topics. Okay, so having stated that uh, overview real quick, let's start to dig in. So 7.1 was labeled as basic approaches. And the basic approaches are for integration. So in 7.1, as they begin the process of integrating techniques, they remind you of the first technique for integration that was introduced in chapter five, which was integration by substitution. And you may recall from the chapter that even as we are using and learning lots of other integration techniques, whether it's trig substitutions or partial fraction decomposition or whatever, it's still very common that you have to do some sort of integration by substitution, either to help with a constant or to set up the problem. So integration by substitution is our number one integration technique, and you always want to be thinking about using it regularly and constantly because it's the number one go-to technique. If you can use that, it's going to make the problem easier. And many problems that need to use something else still need to use some sort of simple level of integration by substitution. So let's look at an example. So uh, I'm going to pull something from the exercise set on page 514 from the end of the section. And I'm going to continually pull our examples from the exercise sets instead of from the description in the section, because I'm figuring then you have an extra example to look at and you can always look at the ones in the section where they've worked them out for you. Okay. So um, maybe let's take a look at I'm going to look at number 12. So it has an integral from negative 5 to 0. 
of one over the square root of four minus X. Okay, so again, as we go through this review, each time we have a problem pop up, even though we have a context that we're thinking about, my recommendation is that you ask yourself, what kind of a problem is this? What is the goal of the problem? And then how should I best approach achieving that goal? What technique should I use? What tool should I use, et cetera? So thinking along these lines, if this problem pops up out of nowhere, the thing I would point out to recognize is that this is a definite integral. It has limits of integration. It is a net area problem. You could think about it graphically, but that in the end, the answer is a number. So what do the uh, instructions for this problem say? They simply say, evaluate the integral. <laughs> and many of the problems in this chapter, that's all they say. Evaluate the integral. It doesn't say anything more. So, since, the, since this is a definite integral and the answer is a number, then one of the things you might ask yourself if you're taking a test or doing this problem is, can I just type it on my calculator? So that would kind of depend on what they wanted. So maybe this is a fill in the blank problem and there's a blank box in my math lab for you to give your answer. Well, then you have to see, well, what does it say about the answer? Do they say that you have to type an exact value? Do they say I should approximate by rounding off to a certain decimal or something like that? If it said round your answer off to three decimals, that means that you can do this problem numerically, and it might even be a suggestion that you should do this problem numerically, because maybe doing it analytically or algebraically is a lot more work or is hard to do. It's certainly valid to just give you an integral and with limits of integration and see if you've learned how to type these on your calculator so that you can come up with a decimal approximation of the answer. That's a skill we want every student to have, that's a skill that I'd like you to consider using if you think it will get you the credit on a problem on your midterm. Now, if it says that they want you to put in the exact value, that's usually a suggestion that you're probably going to need to do this by hand analytically because the answer has got some square root or something like that. However, it's quite possible that it says that, but the exact answer is still a nice answer that your calculator will provide. Like if the net area problem here is five, if the answer to this problem is five, well, that's something that your calculator would tell you if you typed it in. That's an exact value. You would put in a five and you'd be done. You move on to the next problem. So if you can type this on your calculator by using a little square root and setting in the integral, it could be that this is a one minute problem. You put in a five and you put that answer. Another way that you might be able to do this numerically, even if they wanted an exact value, is what if it's not a fill in the blank problem, but instead it's a multiple choice problem. So maybe they have a multiple choice problem and after they give you the problem, they've got an A and a B and a C and A is maybe E to the seventh power and B is the square root of pi and you know, whatever. You got some answers where they're providing exact values, but you have a multiple choice. Well, if that's the case, then you could get the decimal approximation on your calculator and also put in the answers they provided and get the decimal approximations for those numbers and see which one matches. So it could be that if it's a multiple choice problem with exact value answers, you can compare the approximation of those exact value answers to what the calculator tells you the answer is and see which one matches to make your choice. This is all the nature of what kind of a problem it is, what the answer, what kind of an answer you should expect and the tools you might be able to use to get it for test taking strategy. Okay, so last but not least, if there's a box and you're supposed to fill in an exact value and you're probably gonna need to do this analytically. So then you'd be looking at this integral and saying, how can I do this? 
So hopefully you would recognize that if the lump under the radical called the radicand was just an X, then this would be a simple power function and it would be easy to integrate. And so what you could do is substitute out the part under the radical with a U to make it like you want it to be, but then you need to deal with a DU. And in the case here, the DU is just negative one, so that's an easy thing to deal with. So this is a perfect problem to do using substitution, integral integration by substitution. So I would let U equal four minus X, then du is equal to negative one or negative dx. So then I can change my integral and I, instead of having one over root four minus x, I have one over root u. And instead of dx, I have minus du and the x's are gone. Now I would probably want to pull the minus out in front and I might want to change my limits of integration as well. So as I mentioned before, when you are doing a u substitution, you can change the values of the limits of integration on a definite integral to be the u values. Then you never have to back substitute for x. Or you can ignore the limits of integration using u and then back substitute for x and use your new answer with the original limits of integration. My recommendation is to swap out the limits of integration. So when the lower limit is when X is equal to negative five. So if I put a negative five in for U, I'm, I'm sorry, in for X, I get four minus negative five, which is four plus five, meaning that U would actually be nine. So U is a nine when X is minus five. And when X is equal to zero, and I plug in a zero for X, I get that U is equal to four. So my upper limit of integration would be a four in the U value. So this then gives me minus the integral from nine to four of U to the minus one half power DU. questions about how I made that substitution simplified and changed the values of the limits of integration? Wouldn't it be easier to just use like two or one? To do what? Instead of, instead of using five, can you just use like two or one? And where did I use a five? Up there when you said x equals negative five. Oh, so the negative five came in the problem. That was the original limit of integration of the problem. So what do you mean? Oh, by I, didn't, I didn't write that down. Yeah, so the original problem is in black. It was the integral from negative five to zero of that function. And so I had to take the negative five, but I was able to change it into a U value of nine. Is it making sense now or do I need yeah, to Yeah, yeah, I just didn't see that part. Okay, no problem. Other questions at all about how we got to this point? All right, well we might we might, might <coughs> excuse, me, <coughs> excuse me. We might notice that we have two things here that are going to work well. We have a minus out in front of our integral. But also, now that we've changed them, the limits of integration are now kind of in the opposite order. They're going from big to small. So I would use a property of integration that you can reverse the limits of integration if you change the sign of your answer. So this would give me the positive of the integral from four to nine of u to the minus one half du. And then using the power rule, I would add one to minus one half to get positive one half. And that would give me two times the square root of u evaluated from four to nine. I might have gone a little fast there. So if I did, I can fill in details, let me know. Now, because we've changed the limits of integration to be in terms of u, we never have to back substitute for x. So this would be two times the square root of nine minus 
two times the square root of four. So that's two times three minus two times two, which is two. Questions at all about this example problem from the book that's integration by substitution? How did I get two in front of rad u? Okay, uh, yeah, so this, good question. Definitely skipped a detail there. So I got that, I was just running out of room. I apologize for jumping a step there. So when you use the power rule, I would be using u to the one half divided by one half. You add one to the power to get the new power, but then you have to divide by that new power. And dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. Does that make sense, Nassim? Other questions about this problem at all? Okay. So integration by substitution can be simpler than this. It can be more complicated than this. This was a little good example where we did a substitution. We even changed limits of integration because it was a definite integral. Now, if I did not have a definite integral, and I just had a, a indefinite integral, then the goal would be to get a family of functions, and then I wouldn't have any limits of integration to change. I would have to back substitute in terms of x. But if you actually have a number as your answer, not a family of functions, then you can get that number using new limits of integration reflecting the new variable. Okay, let's clear this. So we'll probably do some more integration by substitution as we look at other problems, because as I said, this method of integration keeps coming up again and again and again. So in the meantime, let's move on to the next section in our review. Okay, ugly, but let's do it anyway. So in 7.2, we introduced integration by parts. So as I mentioned before, integration by substitution is kind of like reversing the chain rule. And integration by parts is kind of like reversing the product rule. <clears throat> so there was a formula for that, so let's put that up. It said if we have an integral of something which we'll label as u dv, then this will be equivalent to the expression uv minus the integral of v du. So that's the formula for integration by parts. And the way this works is if we are looking at something in the format on the left, it gives us the option to change it to the format on the right since they're equivalent. And that will be helpful if the new integral that we're left with having to do is easier than the one we started with. So the thing to notice is that the u factor gets swapped out with a du, meaning it's derivative. And the dv factor gets swapped out with v. So V is the antiderivative of DV, and DU is the derivative of U. So when you're integrating by parts, you're basically asking yourself, if I have a product here in my integral that I'm challenged by, would it be easier if instead I was integrating a new product that was the antiderivative of one part and the derivative of the other part? If the new product of the antiderivative times the derivative of the previous parts is easier to integrate, then I should integrate this by parts. 
So that's the philosophy. So to use integration by parts, you have to decide what's going to be my U, which gets differentiated, and what's going to be my DV, which gets integrated in my new integral. And would that make things better? So again, let's go to the problem set. In this case, we're on page 520. And let's grab something fun from in here. How about lucky number 17, which is integral ln of x, I said x, over x to the 10th dx. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for a minute and ask you to become engaged and to think about if this propped up out of the blue and I had no sense of what I was doing in terms of which section I'm supposed to use or something like that, could I look at this and say, what kind of a problem is this? What's the goal of the problem? And then which technique or strategy should I use to achieve that goal? So let me just stay quiet for about a minute and let you think about it. Get your head around the game. Okay, so maybe some of you are able to do this problem. That would be great. That certainly is my hope, but let's go through the thought process. And the thought process still applies even if the problems are more challenging or you get stuck. So first of all, big picture. What kind of a problem is this and what's the goal of the problem? So this is an indefinite integral, meaning there are no limits of integration. And so this is referring to a family of antiderivatives with like the plus C arbitrary constant in there somewhere. And the goal of this problem, the goal is going to be some function in X plus C, like with an arbitrary constant on the end, some family of antiderivatives. So because that's the case, this is definitely not a numerical problem. It's kind of hard to think about this graphically. That's not really helpful. So this is all about analytical and algebraical approaches. So then we sort of think about, well, what technique should I use? The go-to technique is always going to be integration by substitution. But substitution is about compositions of functions. And there's no composition here at all. I could kind of think, well, there's 1 over x to the 10th. So that kind of could be a composition if I wanted to think of it that way. But the problem is when you do the substitution rule, you need something related to the derivative as a factor. And if x to the 10th is my inside function, I need x to the 9th or something like that somewhere else. In any event, it really doesn't seem to look like or naturally go toward um, being integration by substitution. So then the other part is to think about integration by parts. So then you want to think of what product do you have. So the natural product to write is that I have 1 over x to the 10th, and I have the natural log of x, and that if I'm using integration by parts, I would differentiate one of these and integrate the other one and then write my new product in an integral that I'd still have to do. Well, I can differentiate or integrate one over 10 to the x, x to the 10th, because it's just a power function. But the ln of x function, if I integrate that, it gets more complicated and I even have an ln x still. And if I differentiate it, it just becomes 1 over x. So it would suggest to me that if I use parts here, I want ln of x to be the part that is differentiated, which we're referring to as u in the formula above. So that would tell me that to use parts here, I'm going to let u equal ln of x. And let dv equal the rest. 1 over x to the 10th dx. Then if I do that, then du 
is the derivative of ln of x, which is one over x dx. And if dv is x to the minus 10, then v would be the antiderivative of x to the minus 10, which is minus nine times x to the minus, whoops, I have to put it over, sorry. Which is x to the minus nine over minus nine. Where you add one to the power and divide by that new power. Any questions, comments, discussions about how I chose to choose u and dv for my integration by parts? Okay, so then based on the formula above here for integration by parts, the integral I started with can now be written as uv minus integral v du with u and v and all that stuff defined in blue here. So my new, uh, my new problem becomes u, which is ln of x, times v, which is x to the minus ninth over minus nine. So I'm gonna put that minus nine on the bottom, put a minus, put a nine, and put the nine power on the bottom. So that is my uv minus the integral of v, which again is one over nine x to the ninth with a negative, that's v, times du, which is one over x dx. So that's my substituting into the formula for integration by parts the parts for u, v, and du. Questions about that? Okay, so we can do some little simplifications like these minuses make that into a plus. I can pull the 1 9th out front so that I don't need to have the nine in the bottom of my fraction. These two, when they come together, are x to the 10th. And notice we already did the integral of one over x to the 10th. That's how we got from dv to v. So I get negative ln of x over nine x to the ninth plus one ninth and the integral of one over x to the 10th is negative one over nine x to the ninth. So I'm gonna simplify this a little bit and tack a C on it. I'm kind of at the end of my paper here. So I'm just gonna put my plus C and then of course I could move the minus sign out front and multiply those two nines together. So let me just show that I would do that. I'd put a minus here and then I would combine these together to just put an 81 in the bottom of that fraction and then I'd be done. <clears throat> so this was, uh, which one was this? Lucky number 17 from the book. Any questions about that at all? And this example of using integration by parts? It, it would be the same thing if you started uh, with x to the negative 10. Um, sorry, yeah, we had some, some uh, feedback there. Maybe we have two devices going on. <coughs> um, so you said something about same thing we started with? Oh, so uh, with uh, ln of x times x to the negative 10. So like just, just to rewrite at the beginning. Oh, uh, we could, yeah, the problem wasn't rewritten that way at the beginning. It was written as ln of x over x to the 10th. 
So let me squeeze this down here. There we go. So the, I copied it directly out of the book. So this is how it was written in the book. And so that's why in my answer at the end, I also wrote powers of X in the bottom of a fraction that way, instead of with negative exponents. In general, we normally like expressions without negative exponents better than with negative exponents. So if you have a negative exponent, usually you write it as a denominator of a fraction. But of course, we write them as negative exponents when we're doing integrals or differentiation so that we can use the power rule. Got it. So in general, uh, when we get our answer, we just have it in the, in the denominator. Yeah, I mean, um, so if, if you wrote like this stuff parenthetically times x to the minus 9 instead of putting that in the bottom of those two fractions, then you have an answer that is completely symbolically correct to the one that the program was asking for. And if it marked you wrong for that, then that is a case where I would adjust your score. So if you actually didn't use the wrong letter, you didn't round incorrectly, but you algebraically just didn't write it the way they wanted, and they didn't recognize that, then I would give you credit for that. Okay, got it. Yeah, because um, I did write it the way um, with negative exponents. I was just wondering if you could do that. I will. Good question. Other questions about this example at all? I should have double checked just to make sure somebody didn't have a specific question they wanted to ask. So did somebody come to class with a question about 7-1 or 7-2 that they wanted to ask about? How about 7-3? So in 7-3, we have trigonometric integrals. Man, it's spotty today. So the trig integral section primarily was giving us trig functions with powers or product, products of certain trig functions with powers. So uh, if I go to page 529, then we can see an example by looking at uh, exercise uh, something different than the morning class, maybe number 20. And again, the instructions are evaluate the integral. And it gives us an integral of sine cubed cosine to the minus two. Sine th cubed theta cosine to the minus two theta d theta. Come on, you can do it. Oh, that looks terrible. I'm just gonna rewrite it. <laughs> Can't stand it. A little better. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay, so this is number 20. So again, imagine that you've got a bunch of problems you're working on and this one just pops up as something to do. Take 60 seconds and try to think about big question. What kind of a problem is this? What's the goal of the problem? And what strategy or tactic might I use to do it? So question is, will converting it to sine theta times tan theta be useful? <clears throat> um, so it's a good question. So I guess it boils down to sort of the strategy and what you're trying to accomplish in the strategy. So in this case, that would not be useful. 
um, because most of the approaches in 7.3 all had the same idea behind them and they just use slightly different functions. So for example, the sine function was paired with the cosine function. The tangent function is paired to its derivative, the secant function. And so unless we have like that kind of pair, um, then it's not helpful. Um, so having a tan com combined with a sine is less helpful than having a sine combined with a cosine. And here's the reason why. So the idea about how to deal with these products of trig functions is to use the fact that the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of cosine is sine along with the fact that you want to do a u substitution for one of these two. So for example, as uh, uh, Paimon is suggesting, if we do a u sub for cosine, the derivative of cosine is sine and we'd like there to be a sine sitting around there somewhere. And there is. If we did a u sub of sine, the derivative is cosine and they would like there to be a cosine sitting around somewhere. There is a cosine, but it's in the bottom of a fraction because that's a negative exponent and that's not the way we want to have it sitting around there. So that suggests that we would do a u sub where we would let u equal cosine theta and then note that du is equal to minus sine theta and we've got a sine sitting out right in front there. And so that's the, that's the strategy that we want to approach this with. So then the, the follow-up to this is to reorganize this a little bit in preparation for this U sub. And the other thing that we're going to use is the fact that you can convert sines to cosines and vice versa. So let's also remember that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to one. So that means if I have one of them, um, uh, so Wenzel converting sine to sine theta one minus cos, yeah, exactly. That's the conversion that we want to do. So that's why we'd use this identity. So you're on the right track now, Wenzel, that's great. With the idea then that we then have the derivative of cosine and we also have things we can convert to cosines. So here's how I would reorganize this and let's see if we can make sense of it. Before I do the U substitution, I'm gonna take one of these sine thetas and make it part of the D theta and leave the other two. So I have sine squared theta times cosine to the minus two theta. And then I had three signs, so I'm gonna write my other sign here, sine theta D theta. So if I do that, then what I'm noticing is, is that these sine squareds can use this identity to convert them into cosines because sine squared theta converts to one minus cosine squared theta. And that sine theta D theta is DU if I make my U substitution. So that's the structure, that's the plan. So let me pause there and see if people can make sense of that because at this point you would be basically, if, you had, if you're able to see all this, you've conquered the problem and then now you know what to do. Okay. So if we use this U substitution, then I'm left with one minus U squared times U to the minus two, because I'm replacing my cosines with U. Don't like that one. And then sine theta D theta is DU. Uh, except I need a minus sign also, I think. So let me say that that's minus du. And so then I'm going to put du and put my 
minus sine out here. And now it's an easy integral to do because it's a polynomial and we can distribute and go term by term or use the power rule after we distribute. Not really a polynomial, I guess, because of the minus two power. So questions about that U substitution? Okay, so I am going to use the minus to change the order of the difference and I'm going to distribute. So I'm going to distribute this minus two and I'm also gonna distribute that minus sign, this u to the minus two. So that's gonna give me the integral. So um, u to the minus two times negative u squared is just negative one times the minus gives me a one. And then u to the minus two times one times negative is minus u to the minus two. So I end up there, just organizing a little bit. So then if I integrate term by term, I get u minus, and I add one to the power on this power function, giving me one over u, because that's u to the minus one, then I would divide by negative one, which will change this to a positive. So that's my antiderivative. And then again, keeping in mind, what was the goal of the problem? The goal of the problem is a family of antiderivatives in the, value, in the variable theta. So I need to back substitute at this point where u was equal to cosine theta. So this becomes cosine theta and one over cosine theta is uh, secant theta, secant theta plus c. Questions, comments, discussions about this example of a trig integral problem? So the takeaway from this is to recognize that basically in 7.3, in all the trig integral problems where they had powers of trig functions or products of powers of trig functions, that it was manipulation to set up for a U sub, where you're going to U sub for one of the trig functions and set up so that you have the derivative of that U sub in place. And then anything else that's not the trig function you're U subbing for, you want to convert to the trig function you're U subbing for. So in this case, we did a U sub for cosine. So we pulled away one of the signs to represent the derivative of cosine being a sign with a minus. Then the other signs we converted into cosines so that once they're all converted into cosines, except the one I need for the derivative, my U sub goes very smoothly and turns it into an easy integral to do. And this is a perfect illustration of how all of the ones in 7.3, that was the primary intent behind those. Questions uh, about this at all before we move on? Okay. So in 7.4, we did trig substitutions. So trig substitutions was not where our integral had a trig function in it. It was when we used a trig function as a substitution for an integral of a certain kind. And the things that we're substituting for are summaried in a table. So let me put that 
up here. I would recommend that you imagine referring to this. C table 7.4 on page 533 to uh, guide sort of which trig sub you use and how to use it. And again, they do half a dozen problems for you. And let's grab one from the exercise set. So maybe, I don't know. Let's try 15. So those are on page 537, number 15. So again, the instructions are evaluate the following integral. <laughs> so we have an integral and number 15 has the radical of nine minus x squared over x dx. So again, imagine you are doing some math problems and this one just pops up out of the blue and you want to sort of think about, all right, what kind of a problem is this? What's the goal of the problem and how should I try to achieve that goal? I'll take a, uh, uh, I'll mute myself for 60 seconds to give you a chance to try to mentally think about what you would do here. Okay, so what kind of a problem is this? Again, this is an indefinite integral. So the answer to this is not a number, it's a family of functions. Now, I will point out that anytime you're doing an indefinite integral problem, going back to test taking strategy, if you are just supposed to put in your answer because it's a fill in the blank, then you basically just have to do it using the techniques that we talked about. But instead, if it's a multiple choice kind of a problem, then by recognizing that what you're looking for is the family of antiderivatives of this function, then one option you would have would be to just differentiate the choices that they gave you and see which one differentiates correctly to the integrand. Because you're looking for the family of any derivatives, so you could check your answers if they gave you possible answers by differentiating and see which one works to give you the function. So just having mentioned that, let's still assume that we need to do this problem. So how do we come up with a antiderivative here? So again, there's a nesting here, there's a composition. So you could kind of think to yourself initially, well, maybe I wanna let u equal nine minus x squared, then du is equal to minus two x dx. So if I had this floating around somewhere as a factor, then I might be able to make a nice u substitution. The problem is the x that's floating around is not a factor in the numerator, it's in the bottom of the fraction. And I can't make a u sub where I end up with one over du, right? So the fact that this, if, if this x that's written in the problem was up here beside the root instead of underneath it, then that's what we would do. We would do that u substitution and things would go nicely. But because you don't have that structure and instead it's in the bottom of the fraction, then that's not going to work for us. So then we have to think about, well, what else can I do? Again, I'm trying to have you think and view this in the context that we don't necessarily know in advance that this is a trig set problem. I'm trying to help you see how to recognize why it's a trig sub problem and that that's the way we end up approaching it. So the idea here is you say, okay, well, the U sub is not gonna work very nice. You might consider trying to do this integration by parts, but if you do this integration by parts, the factor in the top with the root, 
that isn't nice for integration or for differentiation. Neither way does it get simpler and easier to integrate. So both of those kinds of ideas really don't seem to be naturally working out easily. And what is the biggest worst part of this problem? That I have a difference of squares under a root. That is exactly what trig substitutions are designed to deal with. Trig substitutions are designed to simplify when you have a difference or a sum of squares where one's got the variable and one's a constant under a square root. Or it could be a, like, yeah, anyway. So the basic idea is that that's the structure that leads you to a trig substitution. So if you look at that table on page 533, it basically says when you have the constant squared minus the variable squared, you're gonna use a sign substitution. And that's what we have here. If you had a sum of squares, you'd use a tan substitution. And if you have the variable squared minus the constant squared, you'd use a secant substitution. So that's why I say if you use that table, it'll give you some guidance. So basically here, using the table, this would suggest that the constant squared is nine. So that means the A value is equal to three. And we wanna make the substitution that X is equal to three sine theta. A sine theta, where A is a three. It also says that we're going to want to use an identity and it tells us which one, the identity that in this case, a squared minus a squared times sine squared theta, and I ran out of space, is equal to a squared times cosine squared theta. So that the reason this is helpful is that if we let x be three sine theta, then nine minus x squared becomes nine minus nine sine squared theta, and we can replace all of that with nine cosine squared theta, and then we can apply the square root and make the root go away. So all the trig substitutions are designed to get rid of this complexity up here by replacing a difference or sum of squares under a root with a simple square, perfect square of a trig function so that the square root cancels the square of the trig function and simplifies. Okay, so if I make that substitution, then I get the integral and I get nine minus three sine theta squared because I'm replacing x with three sine and it's squared divided by x so that's three sine theta now i have to do my dx so if x is three sine theta then the derivative of x is the derivative of three sine theta which is three cosine theta d theta probably should have written that in blue here so let's do this. Instead of having my identity here, let's take that out. So then if x is that, then dx is equal to three cosine theta d theta. So then using the identity, this difference of squares in here becomes the square root of nine cosine squared theta over three sine theta times three cosine theta d theta. So let's pause there and see if there are questions about how we chose and applied that particular trig sub before we see what we can do with it.
So supposedly, this is going to give us something that we think we can differentiate. So first of all, the square root of 9 cosine th squared theta is can be reduced to 3 cosine theta. So we can combine those a little bit. I can cancel some threes maybe, like these should just go away. Don't like that, it's too long. And I can pull the three outside here to get rid of it there. So I get three times the integral of cosine squared theta over sine theta. like it. Almost out of space, but I think we can at least get to where we can see the conclusion in a little bit along this next line. So, well, there's lots, a couple of ways we can do that. I'll just do what comes to my mind. So I would see this as one minus sine squared theta over sine theta with a three out front. And that's three times the integral. Uh, three times the integral of cosecant theta minus sine theta, uh, d theta. Sorry, running out of space here. But at this point, you can see that it's done because we have, just to be blunt, we, we know the integral of sine and cosecant, if you don't remember it, we have the integrals of all six primary trigonometric functions. So that means we can definitely provide those. We're gonna to need to back substitute. So I think I need to have some more work we need to do here to back substitute to get in terms of X. But let me pause here since I'm at the end of the page and see if there are questions. No questions at all? I don't know if people are able to follow along or if they've just given up. Usually this is a challenge for a lot of folks. So just please speak up if you have any questions. <clears throat> all right, let's see. Maybe I should try to stay on this page a little bit. So let's erase some of this so I can transfer up. Okay, so what do we have here? We have that this has now become the integral after our trig substitution of cosecant theta minus sine theta d theta. Okay. Okay, so, um, we want to now do this integral. We're now left, we converted an integral we didn't know how to do into an integral that we know how to do. And we want to do this and then back substitute in terms of X to see what we get. 
All right, so into antiderivative of sine is minus cosine. I forget the antiderivative of cosecant. It's not one of our uh, straightforward ones. So let's see if we look that up real quick somewhere. Cosecant or one over sine. Uh, maybe I'll just use the table of integrals to find it. Yeah, all the way down to number 56, huh? Okay, so uh, integral, uh, let's do this somewhere else, in blue, integral of cosecant, oops, no, that's not that one, shoot. I guess I should have 56. Why would they have a table of integrals problem? Was that, do we have that before table of integrals? Maybe I've uh, stuck myself here. I definitely can just look that up, but I thought that was one of our standards, but maybe it didn't come in until after we did table of integrals. I thought it was in an earlier chapter. Anybody uh, have a sense of uh, cosecant theta where we did that if earlier than the table of integrals? Like I see it on 56 on, but I, that's reduction formulas. I didn't think we had to go to that. It's somewhere. I think somebody put it in the chat. Sorry, getting the ghosting again there, Nassim, or Parjit, I mean. Sorry, I think somebody put it in the chat. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, and I just wanted to look it up. So it's it was somewhere, I think it was in chapter five later, I forget, but it's number, it's really early because it's number eight on the table of integrals. So let me just add that in too. But I, 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 don't, I just didn't want to have to look it up on the table of integrals because I know we, had, we, we, we really focus on using the table of integrals in 7.5 in the next, or in 7.6. And so I was trying to find the place where they did it before. So was that chapter five? Anyway, they lump it together on the table of integrals in the very first, first dozen integrals. Um, and I thought there should have been some place before then. But uh, yeah, Wenzel's got the right one. So it's uh, ln absolute value, not friendly, but that's what happens when I just grab one problem from the section set, plus cotan plus C. Yeah, you got the same thing. Anyway, so applying that to the first part, making it ugly in the second part's a little bit nicer. So we would have three <clears throat> times minus ln cosecant theta plus cotan theta. And then we have minus sine and the antiderivative of sine is minus cosine. So that becomes plus cosine theta. And then we can put them together and stick our plus C on the end. Okay. So uh, that was a little uglier than I thought, but that's just what number 15 in the exercise set is. They're certainly gonna feel free to get ugly on you when they want.
questions about that um, integral, how we now finish the integral. Actually, let's save the plus C until we back substitute for X. So I'm gonna take off the plus C. Oh yeah, of course, we definitely have to convert back to X as Paimon is pointing out. So that's why I put on my plus C a little bit too early here. And that's why I wanted a fresh page for the next part of the problem. But. So the thing to notice at this point is the integration is done. So you don't, you're not integrating anymore. You got an integral that you could do from an integral that you couldn't do. And now we have to back substitute for X because we can't change limits of integration because this is not a definite integral. This isn't a number. It's a family of functions and those functions need to be in terms of X. And so we're going to use the fact that X is equal to three sine theta to mean that if I want to plug back in in terms of theta, that theta is equal to inverse sine of x over three. So that becomes negative three, the natural log of cosecant sine inverse of x over three plus cotangent, I said cotan, sine inverse of x over three, running out of space plus cosine of sine inverse of x over three. almost out of space again. So now um, we had this case before, and this is what was reviewed in 7.4, where you have an inverse trig function inside of a regular trig function. And to deal with that, I usually did it by drawing a little right triangle and say, all right, so keep in mind, sine inverse of x over three is the theta that we replaced, right? It's these thetas here. So that theta is in a right triangle. And what do we know about that theta? We know that when you take the sine of that theta, you get x over three. Because that theta is inverse sine of x over three. Sine of an angle is opposite over hypotenuse. So that means we need a triangle where the opposite over the hypotenuse ratio becomes x over three. So we put the x here and the three here. So if we have the x there and the three there, then the missing side is the square root of nine minus x squared. Again, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So that means that this missing side, I have to take the square of the hypotenuse, subtract the square of the other side and take the square root. So all of these thetas, or the theta that's in all of these arguments is the theta in this right triangle here. So that means that I can take the, uh, the cosecant or the cotangent or the cosine of that theta and get the x values in this triangle here. So let's see if I can squeeze this in here. That would be minus three times the natural log of the absolute value. So cosecant is one over sine so one over sine is, um, well actually sine of that would just be x over three. So one over sine would be three over x. Or you can think of it that in this triangle, sine of theta was x over three. So if I flip that, I get three over x. So cosecant of that inverse sine ends up simplifying to just three over X. Cotangent is the flip of tangent. Tangent of theta would be opposite over adjacent X over the root. So cotangent would be the root over X because I would flip it. So that's gonna be the square root of nine minus X squared over X. So that's the stuff that's in the absolute value. And then I have cosine. So cosine of that angle theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse. 
So that would be the root over three. So that's gonna be the square root of nine minus x squared all over three. Now I can add my plus C on the end. And I might join these into one fraction, the part in the absolute value. I'm kind of out of space here, so I'll just stop there. Fun, fun, fun. Maybe I'll blow this up a little bit so we can see it a little better. So it got a little messy in the end, but nonetheless, we can back substitute in for X, and there you go. Questions, comments, discussions about this trig sub? Uh, no over three in the cosine part? Did I drop a three somewhere? It's multiplied by three. Oh, because it got distributed by the minus three. You know, the truth is I just forgot to put down parentheses. Uh, so that's why I didn't distribute. So let me, uh, so, because I had put out front and put the distribute, but absolutely right. So let's, uh, so what was being pointed out is that we have a minus three out here that's supposed to be distributed to everything. And when you go over and multiply here, it'll cancel the three. So let's just say that we did that. So that three would go away and this would be changed into a minus. So if I do that, then absolutely right. I don't need to have a three on the bottom, but also I would need to have a minus if I, I just forgot to distribute. So that would be minus uh, and then we'd have the root nine minus X squared plus C. Not minus, why not minus? Oh, the minus is only on the log. Catching all my mistakes. Perfect. Thank you. That's exactly right. So I had a minus here that was not here. So the original mistake was I put the minus on the three here. The three would be distributed to the cosine, but I didn't distribute it and I didn't put the minus. So that means that here there would be a positive three over here. And that means that when I got down here, that would be a plus. Thanks for keeping me honest there, Wenzel. Getting a little messy and I'm running out of space, but absolutely right, thank you. Devil's in the details. Questions, comments, discussions? So I, I think for many students, the hardest part of 7.4 is remembering this idea about having a trig function and plugging into it in inverse of another trig function. Um, and at the time we did that in class, I mentioned that the book reviewed that trig idea back in chapter one, section four. So if that part really throws you and you don't want this to keep bugging you every time it comes up, you might, you could go back to chapter one, section four to review this idea of something like cosine of sine inverse of something and how to simplify that. Um, but it does show back up again in this uh, chapter here, in this section. Questions, comments, discussions before we move on to partial fraction decomposition? All right, we're kind of halfway through the chapter at this point, and we are about halfway through the class, so seems to be survivable. Okay, so uh, 7.5, we had partial fraction decomposition. is not working well today. Okay, so what was a partial fraction decomposition designed to help us with? Basically just integrals of rational functions. And again, a rational function is when you have a polynomial divided by another polynomial. 
And the big idea was something like we have an integral of a, an f of x over a g of x dx. I'm just sort of writing out some thoughts with the idea real quick, and I'm going to erase this. And that instead we want to rewrite this as an integral of some collection of fractions added together, maybe A, B, and C over linear factors. So, you know, maybe 3x plus 7, x minus 9, x plus 2, or something like that. So the idea behind this is, is that if we could take a fraction of polynomials and break it into smaller fractions where each denominator was of a lower, simpler degree, hopefully linear, then we would be able to integrate in a much more direct way. So that's the idea of partial fraction decomposition. Whoops, but let's uh, eraser. Let's put that with a specific example so that we can see it in action. But that's what you want to think about going in so that that motivates your work. Okay, so um, again, I'll try to put up a, an example from the problem set, which is on page 549. I kind of like that highlighter thing. I should use that more, but uh, now. There we go. All color. And let's see, maybe something 30% of the way through of the difficulty. Hopefully not too bad. Maybe let's try number I don't know. Let's try 18. Something different than the one I did in the morning class. So it uh, not too shockingly, the instructions are evaluate the integral and it provides the integral 21x squared divided by x cubed minus x squared minus 12x Okay, so let me give you guys 60 seconds for thoughts about big picture, what kind of problem this is, what the goal of the problem is, and how you might think about approaching it, imagining it just popped up in the middle of a test. So I'll mute for 60 seconds so I can shut up. Okay, so um, the big picture issue is to first recognize that this is an indefinite integral, which means that the goal of the problem is a family of antiderivatives. And that means that it's a formula, it's not a number, and it's not really helpful to think about it graphically. So then when we look at the kind of integral problem it is, we can see right away that the integrand is a rational function. So with a rational function, we pretty much immediately go to partial fraction decomposition. The idea being that unless, well, here's an exception. If the denominator's polynomial had as its derivative something like the numerator, then it might mean we could do a u sub for the entire denominator. Um, that's not very common. Basically, the numerator has to be some sort of a multiple of the derivative of the denominator for that to work. Uh, and usually, we're just doing a partial fraction decomposition. So, in order to do a partial fraction decomposition and figure out what the denominators of our smaller fractions will be, we need to factor out the denominator here. So, I can take out an x, which would leave me with x squared minus x minus 12. And then if I factor further, I get x minus four, x plus three. So that means that I want 
my denominators after the fracture, partial fraction decomposition to be those three factors, x, x minus four, and x plus three. Okay, so that means I want to somehow take the, uh, take the original integrand, and convert it into three factions where there's something over x plus something over x minus four plus something over x plus three. So the most straightforward, and you don't have to write this step out, but this is just to follow along with the logic. The most straightforward way to see how this is gonna work out is that you would basically take this equivalency and multiply both sides by all three factors, which is the LCD, and let all of the fractions cancel out to see what's left. So for these two things to be equal, that means that 21x squared has to be equal to A times the factors that are not in its denominator, X minus four times X plus three, plus B times X times X plus three, plus C times X times X minus four. So those have to be equivalent. If I can find A and B and C in which those are equivalent, then I can break my original fraction of polynomials into this partial fraction decomposition. So uh, the prescribed method before, which was kind of a shortcut, is to, instead of multiplying all of this out and distributing and solving a complicated system of three equations and three unknowns, we try to use our shortcut, which usually works all the way or at least part of the way to make our problem easier, which is plugging in the zeros of all of our denominators. And that allows you to solve for the letters. So for example, if I let x equals zero, which is the zero value of the first denominator, and I plug that into both sides, then on the left I would get zero, and on the right I would get a, zero minus four is minus four, zero plus three is three, but then I would get b, and since I'm plugging in a zero and x is a factor, I would get b times zero, and similarly I would get c times zero. So this would mean that negative 12a is equal to zero, which means that a has to equal zero. It's kind of surprising. Let's see if I put it up here. So, do I believe that? I guess I have to believe that. Hmm. Doesn't make sense to me that that's correct. Like maybe I made a mistake somewhere. Let me think for just a second before I proceed in case I did. Do I have to, can I throw away the first fraction? Then how do I get three of those? I don't see how I can throw away the first fraction. I see why I can throw away the first fraction. I could have simplified this whole fraction before I even started. Because X is a factor of the bottom and X is a factor of the top of the original fraction. And so that means I could have simplified. So yes, that means A should be zero and it came out right. So I'm now able to trust my work again because I just didn't simplify in the beginning and that's why this became a little bit more complicated than it needed to. So what I'm pointing out here, just for those who want to follow along with what I was talking about, I could have taken this factor of X in the bottom over here and canceled it out with one of the factors of X in the top, because X is a factor of the top. And that's why that factor is not needed. And when I throw this fraction away, things will work. So this will be equivalent. 
So uh, yeah, anyway. So having pointed that out, I'm gonna say that A should be zero. And let's now look at the next letter. So A is equal to zero. So I didn't even need that for the first fraction. So now looking at the second one, when X is a four, if I let X equal four, then um, the first and last factors will cancel out and that'll allow me to solve for B. So I would have 21 times four squared. So 21 times 16, which is what? 210 plus 126, like 336 or something. So I would get 336 is equal to zero because the A minus four factor gets canceled out plus B times four times seven, because X plus three is four plus three is seven, and then plus zero because the third factor cancels out. So then uh, that gives me that 28 times B is 336. So that's 20, uh, 336 divided by 28. Three, seven, twos over two, two, seven. I think that's 12. 336 divided by 28, I think is 12. So if I'm right, then that would give me that B is equal to 12. Taking note of that up top. So then uh, to solve for the last letter, I'm going to let X be equal to minus three because that's going to zero out the first two, allowing me to solve for C. And so if X is equal to minus three, that squared is nine. Nine times 21 is like 189. And so that's equal to zero because uh, X plus three gets zeroed out, plus zero for the B term, plus C times minus three, and minus three minus four is minus seven. So that means that 21 times C equals 189. So C equals 189 divided by 21. And I think I just got that by multiplying 21 by nine. So that means I should get nine, which means that C equals, um, whoops, just did 21. Yeah, so that, that was both positive. So that C is equal to nine, which I'll put up here. C is equal to nine. Okie dokie. Let the games continue. Okay, so basically what I got here was that if I want to do the integral above, uh, I'm going to let A be 0, B be 12, and C be 9. That means that the original integral can now be the integral of 12 over X minus 4 plus nine over x plus three dx. Now, um, because of the confusion that I didn't, in the beginning, cancel out an x in the original fraction, if I add these two fractions together, I get 21 over x squared minus x minus 12. I don't get the original fraction exactly. But in the original fraction, I could then multiply that by x over x to get what I started with. So this is equivalent to what I started with. And now this is an integral that we can do because in each case, we would just do a little u sub for the denominator and then um, use a natural log. So the answer would be 12 
times the natural log of x minus four plus nine times the natural log of x plus three plus c. Questions, comments, discussions about this uh, example, number 18? Bum, bum, bum. So again, this is about probably 30% up in the way of difficulty of these kinds of problems. There were some simpler ones, there were some more complicated ones. I will point out that they had a nice uh, summary. Um, so let's just point this out. Just make space enough to make a summary. So let me just point out that they have a summary for partial fraction decomposition on page 548, where they sort of walk you through the ideas and the steps. And the way these can get more challenging is if one of the, um, if when you factor out the denominator, they don't all become linear factors like this, that instead one of them is a quadratic that's not reducible, that it doesn't factor. And then you basically set it up the exact same way, but in your numerator, you put AX plus B instead of just A. Um, and anyway, look at the examples that they do as those get a little bit more challenging. But uh, if you look at these rational functions uh, for integral problems and think about fra partial fraction decomposition and start that process, then you're, you're on the right road or you're on the, the correct procedure to try to get the problem done successfully. Okay. All right, so let's uh, move on. Maybe I need to make this bigger. That would be better. Let's try that. Okay, so then we have uh, 7.6. So in 7.6, it basically um, don't provide new integration techniques other than they say, well, now that we've learned all these techniques, you could do a lot of integrals with these and we have already done a lot of integrals. And that at some point we basically accumulate these results into a big table of integrals. And so it then literally becomes a strategy to instead of replicating all the work that has been done before, to say, all right, well, maybe I come across some tough problem that was done over the past and somebody wrote down the results and I can use those results. So they give you the table of integrals and it has 108 integral formulas on it. So they give you problems, a lot of which in this section where they'll say, do the integral by using the table, meaning they want you to look up the integral problem on the table so that you can imagine doing that when you get stuck on an integral and trying to use the table. So when we looked at this in class and I discussed this, I mentioned the idea that if you're going to use the table in a problem where you have to justify your work, you're gonna to have to reference which number on the table was the integral formula that you used. But now that all of our remaining tests are my math lab and we don't show any work or give any justification, then you can use the table of integrals anytime you want. And as long as you get the right answer, you, you don't have to refer to it. You don't have to give the number. Uh, you can use a Ouija board if you get the right answer because my math lab just cares about the answer. So let's look at uh, an example of uh, a problem from that section where they expected you to use the table to see if we could try to do it. If you've got the table handy or you want to give this a shot first, like on an earlier problem like we did when we looked, well, at least when I looked up cosecant and found out that it was number eight, then um, 
then you might get the table ready. And let me find a problem in the back of the section to use as an example. Let's see, here we go. So exercise set begins on five, five, five. I don't know, let's see, how about, How about, hmm. let's try 21. Looks real simple. So it's interesting to think we might feel we need to use a table. So example 21 is the integral, ln squared of x dx. Okay, so let me give you 60 seconds to to imagine you're doing a bunch of problems and this just pops up and you want to think what kind of problem is this, what's the goal of the problem and how should I try to do this problem. Okay, so if we're looking at this problem and it shows up out of the blue, then we can sort of say, all right, this is an indefinite integral. We need a family of derivative functions. For example, if there were multiple choice answers in my math lab test, maybe you could just differentiate them and see which one gave you ln of x squared or ln squared of x, or however you want to think of it. Might be, but if you have a open box problem and you're supposed to fill in the answer, then instead we might uh, be expected to um, get this ourselves. Whoa, this is 2.53, is that the right time? We have like 22 minutes left, wow. Uh, I have not paced this very well, I apologize. We do not have a lot of time left in order to cover the last couple of sections. Let's go ahead and do this problem real quick and see if we can talk about remaining sections of chapter seven as best we can. Okay, so um, the thing to point out here is even though we have a nesting, um, we don't have the derivative of the inside function sitting anywhere. We could think of this as ln of x times ln of x and use parts where both u and dv are both ln of x. Uh, and that's probably what was done here originally to do the problem. But um, instead we're going to look like uh, we want to pull this on the table. So Jack says 103. Yeah, I'm seeing the exact same thing. So very good pull there, Jack. So on the table, number 103. So let's see what that says and see if that would help us to be able to do that. So on 103, it has the integral of ln to the nth power of x equals, and it has x ln to the nth power of x minus n times the integral of ln to the n minus one of x dx. So this has this sort of looks kind of like the problem here, but what this does is this allows us to replace the integral we have with an nth power of ln with an integral with one smaller power. But if we go down to one smaller power from ln squared of x, we just get ln of x, and we know that integral already. That was done with parts. That's number 11 on the table. So this is what we want to do. This is definitely the one we want to use. So what does that allow us to replace this with? So if n is a 2, then I'd be putting in a 2 here and here and here in order to use this formula. And so that would give me x times ln squared of x minus two times the integral of ln of two minus one, which is one x dx. And then uh, if you didn't remember, this one is number 11 on the table. 
Uh, it was one of the ones that we actually did using integration by parts back in 7.2. But now that it's a result, we can just pull it from the table or remember it or have it in our notes. And so that gives me ln, ln squared of x minus two. And the integral of ln of x is x. You could also use this formula again and go down to the zero power, you'll get the same thing. Uh, is um, x ln of x minus x. So if we just distribute, so we can simplify a little bit, we have x ln squared or ln of x squared minus 2x ln of x plus, why did I do that? Plus positive 2 times x plus c. So yeah, it's a matter of looking it up on the table and coming up with the right formula and applying the formula correctly. And that's one of the big skills or the basically the big takeaway from 7.6. So it looks like we have a little under 20 minutes left. I don't, I don't know, maybe we talked about the test a long time in the beginning. I apologize. Somehow I thought we'd have more time, but as I knew it'd be a struggle to get through the chapter, but I thought we would do better than I just have. So let's proceed on with the remaining time and do our best. So happily, we skipped 7.7. .7. Um, that was a skipped section of numerical integration, which we never planned to do. 7, 8, we had improper integrals. So let's go to an example right away. Jesus. So um, those are on page 578. And I think I will take a quick look at the one that I looked at in the earlier class because it's a good illustration of concept. So where the heck was that? 18. So here's the problem. The integral from zero to infinity, cos x dx. So um, as time is short, let's just discuss this. So this is an example of an improper integral, in this case, because one of the limits of integration is infinity. The other possibility would be that somewhere within the limits of integration, the function is undefined. Um, but in this case, it's obviously undefined at infinity because that's not a number. So conceptually, the idea was that the way we get around this is we just set up a limit where we set the value of that limit of integration to go to infinity. And then we think of it as a normal function with an upper limit that's bound and defined and then we take the limit. So um, the thing I would point out is that as soon as you have a limit as b goes to infinity of an integral, um, then this becomes a limiting problem and limits may exist or they may not exist. And this is where we first kind of started to think more about the idea of converging or diverging. And so I can, well, let's say we went ahead with this problem um, symbolically. So this would give me the limit as B goes to infinity and the antiderivative of cosine is just sine. So this is sine of x evaluated from zero to b, which is the limit as b goes to infinity, sine of b, because sine of zero is zero. So this is like a chapter two problem now. And so you may or may not recall that the sine of b as b goes to infinity just keeps going up and down and up and down and oscillating between one and negative one but never settles on a value. And the word we use here is we say that this diverges. Now, you can also think of this, because it is, as a net area problem, and maybe then you can make sense of this. The cosine function, right, 
is just this wave that goes off to infinity. And if I try to accumulate and add up that net area as it keeps going off to infinity, it never settles on a value. Every bump above has an area of two. Every bump below has an area of negative two. And it just keeps adding two, then subtracting two, then adding two, then subtracting two as the net area heads off toward infinity. But it never stops and it never settles on a value. So it diverges. You, this would be a problem who, if, if you thought about it, I would hope you could look at it and just say, oh, this is a 10 second problem. There's just no way that this can settle on a value if you think of it as a net area problem. Of course, you can do this work here, but it definitely diverges. Another way to think of it is this is uh, an early example before we even got there of why the divergence test works. The divergence test for series said, well, if the terms of the series aren't shrinking away to zero, then I can't add them up off to infinity and have the results settling on a value. Well, the same is true here for this net area problem. If the value of the function is not shrinking away to zero, then as I head off toward infinity, it keeps changing the answer by giving me some new net area. So this is an example that you might quickly come up with the fact that it diverges. If it didn't diverge, then this limiting process would produce the result. But in this case, it diverges. So for the improper integrals, they may diverge, and then the integral doesn't give you an answer, or it may converge to a value if you can evaluate this limit, in this case, as b goes to infinity, at the problematic um, limit of integration. Questions, comments, discussions about this reminder example or something from the improper integral section? All right, well, thanks to those of you who are still managing to do so for hanging in through this long slog without a break. So we've got about 12 minutes left to look at the longest section in the chapter. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. So 7.9, which will have six um, related problems on Wednesday's midterm, was about differential equations. And there were some phases of problems in the differential equations. Let's see if we've eight, 17 minutes, we can look at two of them. No, no, 12 minutes. Oh my gosh. All right. So first of all, what is a differential equation? It's an equation that involves the derivative of a function and usually the function itself. And so solutions to differential equations are usually families of functions. Not specifically antiderivatives because you don't necessarily know what the derivative is directly. You only know how the derivative is involved in an equation. So it's a family of functions that satisfies the equation. So the first types of problems they gave you in this section were problems in which you would just check and see if a given function was a solution or not. The next phase of the problems was to be able to come up with the solution fam yourself using separation of variables as a solving process. And the last phase was to be able to do like direction fields or slope fields and look for equilibrium solutions, et cetera. So let me just sort of summarize that and then we'll see what we can look at as an example as time permits. 7.9 with differential equations. Sort of uh, phase one of learning and practicing these was what's that? Meaning what is a differential equation? What's a solution to a differential equation? Step two or phase two of our learning and understanding process in this section was to be able to solve one. <laughs> and phase three was to consider it graphically in the nature of solutions. And I'll just write down direction fields or slope fields. So, um, if I'm looking at page 589, example on page 589, 
all of these look like. Uh, let's just look at number 10. So it said y equals c t to the minus 3. And it had y derivative of y. There we go. It's number 10. Okay, I'm copying right. And then it gave us that t y of t prime, y prime of t plus 3y equals 0. So the instructions are verify that the given function y is a solution of the differential equation that follows it. Assume that the c is a constant. So the goal for this, just to understand what differential equations are, was to recognize that we have a differential equation, an equation involving the derivative of the function and the function itself. And solutions to a differential equation are functions that make it true, that satisfy it. And to see if we understand that, we're supposed to test the one that's provided. So to test this, we need to figure out, well, what's the derivative here? And then we can plug that into the equation. If I plug, if I take the derivative of c times t to the minus three, I would use the power rule and I would get minus three c t to the minus four. So then the question is, if I plug that in to the equation and the function, will the equation be satisfied? So I'm plugging this in for y prime and I'm plugging this in for y. So if I do that, I get t times the derivative, which is minus 3c t to the minus 4, plus 3 times the function, which is c t to the minus 3. And the question is, do I get 0? So if you see I multiply by t, then the t power reduces, and I do get 0 equals 0. So that's a check. And that's what we were supposed to verify, and it does verify. So that's the idea of a differential equation and an example of just checking that you understand what the differential equation is saying about a function and whether a given function might be solution to that. Now we expect there's a whole family of solutions. Uh, in this case, this family has the arbitrary C in it already and we checked and confirmed that that's the right family. Questions, comments, discussions about that? Okay. So next up, if we're looking at sort of being able to actually solve one of these instead of just checking an answer that's already been given to us. So maybe we'll look at uh, find the general solution of the following equations. So I'll try number 23. So for the middle, we're going to do example or exercise number 23 on the same page. And it has y prime of t is equal to negative 2y minus 4. So again, um, it gives us this and it says find the general solution. So that means the family of functions with some arbitrary c in them that satisfies this differential equation. And we really only had one method for solving these, which was called a separation of variables. So instead of y prime of t, I'm going to write dy dt. And just to set up for a little bit of success, I'm going to factor out a minus 2 here, leaving y plus 2. And the idea is that you get all the y stuff on the left and all the non-y stuff or t stuff on the right. So I would do that by multiplying both sides by the reciprocal of y plus 2 so that those go away and multiplying by dt on both sides so that those go away 
So if I do that, I get one over y plus two dy is equal to minus two dt. Then by moving all the y stuff on the left and the non-y stuff on the right, I can now integrate both sides, each with respect to their own variable. And this would then give me, so I do sort of a little u substitution here, but I would get the natural log of y plus two is equal to minus two t plus an arbitrary constant c. I've kind of combined the arbitrary constants from both sides here. I'm, again, I'm trying to solve for the function, which is the y, so I need to solve this for y. So now I'm gonna raise both sides to the power e so that those cancel out. And I get the absolute value of y plus two. And I have e raised to all this stuff as a power. So I'm gonna pull the e to the c part out front to the left. And the other part is e to the minus two t. This was a tactic we introduced at the time that you have e raised to the power of c as a sum can be pulled out as a factor. Then to solve both sides, since there's an absolute value, I take the, drop those by putting a plus or minus. So then I get y plus two is equal to plus or minus e to the c e to the minus two t. Then by checking directly, which we are almost out of time, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but I'm gonna remind us that we said this whole thing basically can be collapsed into a single arbitrary constant. Instead of having the positive or negative result of E raised to any arbitrary constant, we just reduce that to an arbitrary constant. And then we subtract two from both sides. So I get the general solution as being C E to the minus two T minus two. And that's my family. You could check that by plugging it in to the original equation to make sure that works, but that's the idea. Questions about that? Okay, two minutes for phase three. So for phase three, the idea was if you have a differential equation, you can think about it graphically. So taking the same differential equation that we have here and thinking about it graphically, we would create what's called a direction field. And the idea behind that is that you imagine a graphing grid and X and Y values, or if it's T, T and Y values. Mm -hmm. And what the value of the derivative would be if you are at a particular value for t and y. Now in this case, only y is in the equation. So that means at a particular horizontal height for a y value, all the slope or the direction lines are the same. So for example, um, because this was minus 2 times y plus 2, I can see that when I plug in a negative 2, I get 0. So any point, no doesn't matter what t is, any point where y is equal to negative two is gonna cause this derivative to be zero. If y is zero, I get minus four, so I have kind of a steep downhill line. If I have y is negative one, I still have a downhill line, but not quite as steep. And as soon as y goes below negative two, like to negative three, I start getting positive slope values. And the further down I go, the bigger those positive slope values get. And up here I have all negative values. Sorry, this is quick and crappy, but we're down to the last minute. And so this is a direction field. You can enter these into a graphing calculator or a graphing utility, and it'll make these for you. You may recall from our classroom discussion that if you have a place where the derivative gets zeroed out at a particular function value, then that's called an equilibrium solution. We even discussed a little bit the difference between stable and unstable equilibrium solutions. Like in this case, if I'm at a negative two and I leave it a little bit, I still have a solution that sends me back to negative two on either side. 
So this is a stable equilibrium solution. Talked about a marble on the bottom of a bowl or the top of a bowl if it's upside down. We had so much fun in class, I miss those days. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's sort of how this last section finishes out. Sorry it was so quick and we are now a minute over, so we will finish here.